Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect NOAA to all, helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Now this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now today, I'll be introducing you to Aaron Kane and Jay Grove with NOAA Fisheries Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Key Biscayne, Florida. Now, while we'll be talking about coral reef fish in Florida, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the tra traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Aaron and Jay are coming to us from the land of the Seminole and Miccosukee nations. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. I also want to extend special thanks to our American Sign Language interpreters, Crystal Butler and Michael Hernandez. Now, a few guidelines before I hand you over to Aaron and Jay. You are all muted because we want a, we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure. Hey, everybody. Um, sorry, Grace had some technical difficulties. So this is Nicole Bartlett stepping in. Um, she was almost at the end of the introduction there. She was just going to say that um, everyone's muted because our speakers need to be heard. And uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat box where we will um, stop periodically and answer those. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Jay and Aaron. Are you guys ready? Oh, great. <laughs> All the technical problems today. All right, thanks guys. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm gonna be the first person to speak, but it's good to see Aaron on screen uh, quickly. So we're gonna to talk today a little bit about coral reef fish surveys, and that is the how and um, why we count and measure fish. So Aaron and I did not start out as adult, um, as adult scientists. We were once children as well that had a curiosity and interest in the marine environment. Um, we decided to pursue our interests further so that we could keep asking questions and become scientists and to protect the marine environment. Erin went on to go get her master's in professional science from the University of Miami, and I continued on to get my PhD from Auburn University. So the question that I have to start this off to ask you guys this question is, what are fish, right? So I'll give you a little bit of a background. We know they've been around for millions of years. They're found in freshwater and saltwater, so lakes and rivers and the oceans. They're vertebrates, they have a backbone. But what make fish different from another animal? So fish have a mouth, an elephant has a mouth. If you're just looking at a picture of a fish, what makes a fish a different? Okay, Jay, let me see what kind of answers we're getting here. So um, Theodore says a fish is an animal that can breathe underwater. Um, Garrett says that they breathe through gills and Texas noted that they have gills as well. Um, let's see, Michelle in Hawaii says that they live in the water, obviously. And um, let's see, I think Katya says um, food, like their food is different, I suppose. Um, any other good answers? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Jasper says that their habitat is in the water and, um, and, and Hannah adds that they're an important part of the ecosystem. How are those? Those are great. So they are an important part of the ecosystem. They do live in the water. What I was going for and I heard were gills. So gills are, you know, specialized organs that allow fish to breathe oxygen out of the water. So that's something that we can't do or any other land animal cannot do. So fish are really unique because they have gills. And the other thing that I was looking for too, are they have fins. So they're one of the species that have fins and that helps them move and propel in the water. So how are fish important? So fish are important for a number of different reasons, but if we just start Initially, why are they important to humans? So as you can see on 
this slide here, there are pictures of humans um, either around surrounding fish, uh, whether it be at a restaurant, on a boat, or fishing. And so commercial and recreational fishermen fish for fish. So commercial fishermen sell fish. And you know, between the two, it can be billions of dollars of sales each year. Recreational fishermen are typically like you going out with a family member and catching fish where you can keep it for food um, or you can throw it back. As a whole, um, Fisheries um, support communities, so about 1.7 million jobs in U.S. communities, and they're a vital food source. The average American eats about 16 pounds of fish per year. So fish are really important to humans, but I think it, I don't may even get the name right, Grace mentioned that, you know, they have a lot of ecosystem value. You know, fish are really important to the ecosystem before humans decided that they were important. You know, they were a prey species to a larger fish species. They may have a cleaning function um, and to take care of the reef. So fish have all these important roles um, without the roles that we think are important from them. So how are fish protected? NOAA Fisheries is tasked with prevent, protecting fish. Um, so there are US regulations that try and prevent overfishing, so taking too many fish out of the water and creating a sustainable fisheries. So a sustainable fisheries means that there's enough fish to catch now, as well as enough fish to catch in the future. And so some of the ways that NOAA goes about, or any agency, whether it's a state agency or federal agency, goes about managing fish, you can put size limits in place. So the bottom left picture, is a picture of a redfish. And you can see that it's on a measuring board. And so you can only keep redfish of a certain size. And so one of the ways is to make sure that there's enough larger fish that are left in the population or enough fish left at a reproductive size so that fish can reproduce for future generations. The middle picture are gear limitations. So sometimes we can only use certain types of fishing traps or net sizes, but this picture is a good example of a hook size. And so some hooks can sit better in the corner of a fish's mouth, which causes less damage. Um, and so especially for a species, if you might throw them back, you don't wanna use a hook that may injure them and create you know, disease after you throw them back or an injury. And then there's also um, pound limitations. So this could be in a recreational fishing scenario, um, an angler can keep two fish per day. In a commercial fish scenario, it's done by pounds. So thousands and thousands of pounds, there's a limit on how much you can take to make sure that enough fish remain for sustainable fisheries. If you would like to learn more about um, how NOAA protects the fisheries and you know, uses all these methods to create sustainable fisheries, there's a NOAA Live webinar about that called Fishing for Food and Fats, and it's found on the NOAA Live webinar page. So we're gonna focus down a little bit more and talk about coral reef fish. And so these are species that live on coral reefs and coral reefs are living. So coral is a living organism and they grow their hard skeleton, um, this calcium carbonate skeleton that they grow and they live. And so coral reef fish are very, very diverse because coral reefs are beautiful. They're gorgeous. They have gorgonians, they have corals, there's a lot going on in the bottom, and so the fish match this diversity. And this is similar to uh, rainforest on land. When you think of an area that's small but has a lot of different species that look different from one another, that's what a coral reef is just underwater. And again, there's a bunch of NOAA Live webinars if you want to learn more about coral reefs, um, one of which is called Saving Corals, a day in the life of a coral reef scientist. And the other one is called Dive In and Explore the Coral Reef Ecosystem. So there's more opportunity to check out coral reefs if that's something you're interested in. And Erin and I are very passionate about coral reefs. So here, what we mentioned is we're gonna talk about how and why we count and measure fish. So first, in order to count fish, you have to make sure that you know how your species of fish, right? You know how to identify fish. So. I'm gonna ask this question to you guys. This up on the slide, there's a picture of similar species. So species that really could be confused with one another. What are some of the ways, when you guys take a look at these pictures, what are some things you can use to tell these somewhat similar fish species apart from one another? 
Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. Sorry, I disappeared like that, but I'm back now. So the question that Jay is asking is, how do we identify fish? So take a look. What are the characteristics that we're looking for that will help us tell um, different fish species from each other? And some of the um, answers, Michelle says color, and that's what Theodore is saying as well, that you wanna look at the color. Um, Isabella, is, Isabella is saying shape. Azul is saying shape, and maybe if whether they have um, stripes or not, so again, color. And um, that seems to be the overwhelming um, color, size, and shape is what Katya says. So I think that's what we've got. Jay, back to you. All right, you guys hit the nail on the head. It's color, size, and shape, just as you mentioned. So on the left-hand side, you know, the brown chromis from the blue chromis, that's color. And that's the easiest way to tell those two apart from one another. The middle pictures of the yellow goatfish and the yellowtail snapper, their color is more similar, but really you're telling them apart by their shape. The goatfish has some barbells that hang out from underneath their face. Um, that's one of the distinguishing characteristics. And then on the far right is a picture of a schoolmaster snapper and French grunt. And really the schoolmaster snapper is a lot larger than the French grunt, as well as they have some color differences. So with that, I'm gonna pause here for a moment with the slides and just take a moment to ask, does anybody have any other general questions before I move on? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So um, some of the questions that have come in, um, one person, you had a picture there and they were wondering if those were whiskers on the fish. Okay, so those are fish barbells, which are sensory organs underneath and typically species with barbells um, eat they use that as a sensory structure to find food on the, on the sea floor. All right, and then this question comes from um, Juan, and Juan is wondering, I, th I think I predicted this would come in, which is your favorite fish that you see on the reef? Juan, that is the hardest question to answer. They are all amazing. It's really hard to pick a favorite, but, and my favorite changes from day to day, time to time, depending what I'm interested in looking at. But if I had to pick my favorite at the moment, it would be a fish called a red hind, which is a grouper. And I just like that it has pretty dots all along its body and it sits there so I have plenty of time to view it and count it. Great, and you know what? I'm gonna hold on to the other questions and, um, and let you continue on, Jay. Okay, perfect. All right, so we already learned that shape size and color are some things that help us identify a fish. But also sometimes it's really important to know the parts of the fish because that can change. And especially if you're having a conversation with somebody, these are some of the distinguishing um, parts of the body that really could help you explain what you saw. So we don't have time to go through this one by one, but there's a word bank on the right. I'm gonna give you time to think about each of them and write down at, you know, at home what you think it is. So number one, So number one, it's hard because you're probably reading through the word bank. I'll give you a little bit more time for this one, but number one is an operculum. So an operculum is a protective covering of the gills that can be used to help a fish um, protect those sensitive organs. It's like you having your rib cage protecting your lungs. You know, you don't want them exposed, uh, but it can also be used to help ventilate. So pump in respiration and for feeding. Number two, so there's a whole list of fins on the right-hand side. I know you guys can already see that we're pointing to a fin. So the question is, what do you think this fin is called? And if you think about the human body up here on the chest, which this is about the chest of the fish, these are considered our pectoral muscles. And this is that fin is considered to be a pectoral fin. Number three, is a little challenging. It's tucked up, but it's a good point. Fish can extend their fins and they can also tuck, um, tuck up their fins if they're trying to go at faster speeds. So in this case, this fish is called a permit and it has its fin tucked up. If you're thinking about the human body again, this is more in your hips region. So these are considered to be your pelvic fins. Number four, So it might be hard to see, you might have to get a little bit close to your screen here, but what we're really looking at is this discoloration, it's a different color, it's not discoloration, it's a different color 
um, and it's a line, and that is called a lateral line. And so a lateral line is a sensory organism that are sensory sensory organ that's found in aquatic organisms, um, and it's used to detect movement and vibration. And so lateral lines are incredibly important. You know how you see these videos um, with all these fish that are schooling and they're moving at the same time and they, you know, just, it just seems like they all do it together. The lateral line is what allows them to sense and move in a school. Number five, again, we know this is a fin. Your word bank is getting a little bit smaller, so I'll give you a little bit less time. So this area would be considered to be the back of the fish. So it's pointing to the back and the back of the fish is considered the dorsal surface. So this is the dorsal fin. Number six. We're out, you have two fin options. It's either the anal fin or the caudal fin. And the answer is, this is the anal fin, which is really close to the cloaca of the fish, which is where the fish goes to the bathroom. Number seven. Again, this is really looking at this area where the tail joins the fish's body. That area is called a caudal peduncle. And the depth and size of the caudal peduncle can give you an idea about the power of the fish. So if there's a really, um, make sure my hands on the screen, if there's a really thick caudal peduncle, this might be for something that's an ambush predator or something that has to escape predation. So you have a couple really forceful thrusts and then you're gone that fish is gone, where a very narrow caudal peduncle like you see in this permit here is for sustained swimming and for sustained faster speeds. And this final one is already on the word bank, so you guys should know this is a caudal fin. So the tail fin, fish of a fin, we call the caudal fin. So now we're gonna take a look at these fish. We're gonna go through them. Um, and what I want you to do is think about color, shape, size, the fins that we just talked about. What can all of this, you know, just by looking at this picture, what can you tell me about the fish in this picture, just from what you already told me that you can use to identify? So take a look at this fish and tell me what you know. Okay, so this is Grace from the chat box. So Jay wants you to take a look at the blue parrot fish, the fish in front of us. And what can you tell about that fish looking at um, its shape, its size, its color, all those characteristics. So Isabella says that they are not predators. And Hannah um, is saying it has a beak. So um, she must know that it poops out sand. And um, Theodore says that it, um, it looks like it's slow. Charlie's looking at the mouth shape. Um, and Katja saying they eat coral. So a lot of great comments. Back to you. Wow, those are really great answers. Um, thank you guys. Uh, absolutely, that mouth shape, you guys are right. It's very strange and they do use it to crunch on corals as they swim by. They're not particularly fast fish, as was mentioned, but they do have that thick caudal peduncle. So when they need to do a couple quick tail thrusts, they can get away from a fish if they need to. But generally speaking, they just swim slowly along the reef, snacking. The next fish here is called a red grouper. Same question. What can you guys tell me about the red grouper by looking at this photo? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So now we're on the red grouper. What can you tell um, about the red grouper again, looking at its shape, its size, its color? Um, Hannah says that it looks like it blends in really well with its surrounding. I'll add the word, it looks camouflaged. Julian says it looks like, and Garrett, that it looks like it has a large mouth, maybe suggesting it's eating um, large things. Um, Theodore says it looks like it might be fast. And um, Julian says that it just looks really big. And Texas says that its dorsal fin looks a little different in the front than in the back. Does that tell us something? And Mrs. He Ray's class is commenting on the camouflage. Everyone's noticing camouflage, large eye, small tail. Back to you. All right, so I'm thinking I'm gonna remember as many of those as I can, but camouflage, absolutely. 
um, this red grouper can camouflage very well into its surroundings. And what it does is it uses that to lure in prey. So it doesn't have to go swimming, searching for food. The food hopefully will swim by it and it can open up its large mouth that everybody talked about and eat that food. So red grouper eat invertebrates. So uh, things without a backbone, so snails or crabs. Um, they also eat other fish species. Uh, red grouper can swim, but I wouldn't say they're the fastest fish. They're no tuna. Um, but they can do, you know, sustained periods of time. And the fun fact to know about a red grouper is they are very photogenic. We could get close to this fish because they are not afraid. They will sit in front of our divers for the entire survey. <laughs> the next fish here, same question. What can the color, shape, and size tell us about this hogfish? Okay, this third time, um, I think this is our last one. What can you tell us about the hogfish? So Julian comments that this one actually looks like it has a small mouth. And Garrett says that it looks like it has teeth. And Laura says, yeah, sharp teeth. Julian notices that the tail looks really big. Um, so maybe, it, uh, and Theodore thinks maybe it can move fast if needed, but maybe doesn't all the time. Hannah thinks its markings look like coral, so maybe it helps to camouflage it. And um, there's a, there are a couple of guesses. Mitsuko is guessing that it's a predator. So a couple of people are guessing predator. All right, back to you, Jay. Thank you. I mean, you guys have some really, really great observations. I think you hit everything that I would possibly want to say about this fish. Um, but the teeth I will comment on, this is a, a fish that really crushes its prey. So it doesn't eat other fish species. It eats um, snails and really crushes them. And that's why it has those teeth to pick it up and then it can crush them down. Everything else you mentioned about its swimming, um, its coloration, that's all true. Um, the interesting thing about hogfish are they can form harems. So one male and a lot of females that stick together um, throughout the breeding season. So with that, I have another time set aside if we want to answer any more general questions before I hand this over to Erin. Yes, this is Grace from the chat box. We had a few questions come in. Katya was wondering, how do you tell a male versus a female fish? So in some species, you can tell externally. Most species, you really can't tell. Um, so that's something that you can only tell um, after the animal is deceased, they are coming up with technologies like ultrasounds like you use on pregnant women or um, some cameras. But in order to do that, you have to take the fish out of the water for sampling. So underwater, unless it's one of the species that has specific markings, which a lot of them don't, there's no way to tell. Great, and Mrs. Hiray's classes, um, a student is wondering, what would be your least favorite fish and why? <laughs> my least favorite fish? Wow, I've never been asked that question, so I appreciate the originality. Um, I would say any fish that really bothers me on a scuba dive, um, which are very rare, often fish don't care um, about us. So my least favorite fish, uh, gray trigger fish sometimes like to bite me or bite my hair, and I find that to be a little unnerving. However, I would say that their attitude also makes them one of my favorite fish. Good answer. <laughs> I like that. Uh, we had another question that uh, since we have the hogfish up in front of us that comes from Texas and Texas is wondering that hogfish has a red spot on the back of its dorsal fin. And is that something that all hogfish have or is that just a marking on this specific one? No, that's something that carries through with hogfish species at different sizes. Nice observation, Texas. You're very observant. And um, Mrs. He raised class an another student is wondering what fish is more aggressive? Is there one particular type of fish on the reef that's the most aggressive? No, there's not. There are different species of fish that are more aggressive just naturally. And typically those are the fish that you catch fishing, right? You don't end up catching the fish that aren't interested in the hook that you put down underwater. Um, so any of the big predators that are really always looking to eat, um, those are the species that tend to be the most aggressive. Sometimes during mating season, a male could be more aggressive, but generally speaking, it's by families of fish. And like I said, those are the ones that you're gonna catch. Great, all right, I'm gonna hold on to the rest of the questions and um, let you hand it over to Erin. So back to you. All right, thank you guys and I'll be back, but right now I'm gonna hand this over to my colleague Erin so she can really get into the nitty gritty details about how we count and measure fish.
All right, thank you, Jay. So now that we've kind of talked about what we're looking for when we're looking at fish, why do we do these surveys? So there are US laws that mandate the management and monitoring of US reef fish. And this started in 1976 with the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. So management is like what Jay was talking about before about how we protect fish. It's about making sure there's enough fish left at the end of every fishing season to continue having more and uh, maintain ecosystem balance. So the program that me and Jay are a part of is the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, which started in 2013. And the data from this program is used to look at status and trends of US coral reefs. And that means to look at, you can look at the fish populations and then see if they're going up or down, staying the same. Those are the things we're looking at. And Jay will talk a little bit about that more later in the presentation. So where are we doing this? The National Coral Reef Monitoring Program monitors all US reefs, but Jay and I are in the Atlantic. So this is, we're in the southeastern part of the United States down here in Florida, and all the areas in light blue highlights are reefs that we monitor. So I'm gonna go through these for you guys. Like I said, Jay and I are in Florida, and we do surveys in the Florida Keys, the Dry Tortugas, which are islands west of Key West, and an area we call Southeast Florida, which is from Miami-Dade County up to Martin County. We also do surveys in the Flower Garden Banks. These are a group of islands offshore of Texas, and they are a part of a national marine sanctuary. And if you want to hear more about the Flower Garden Banks, a few weeks ago, there was a NOAA Live webinar about these. So you can look at those up and learn more. We also survey in the U.S. Virgin Islands, which, are a U which is a U.S. territory. And there are three islands, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix. And we survey sites all around all three. And finally, we survey reefs in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is also a U.S. territory. It's actually the largest U.S. territory. So we survey around the island and also around the many small islands that are around Puerto Rico. So that's a lot of different places. That's a lot of reefs and we need a lot of people to do these surveys. So who is counting all of them? We have scuba divers from many different organizations. It's a cooperative effort between government agencies like NOAA, inst educational institutions, which are like universities and schools, and local agencies. All of these people uh, put in a lot of different divers so that we can accomplish hundreds of surveys every year. So I'm gonna show you what, I keep saying survey. What exactly is the survey that we're doing? It's called the RVC or Reef Visual Census. And I'm gonna play a little graphic video here so you can see exactly how we're doing this. So we start with a coral reef and we come up and the divers will drop down into the water with a flag to mark their spots. They're gonna swim out two and a half meters to the middle of an imaginary cylinder. In this cylinder, they're gonna write down every species of fish they see. They do this for a few minutes and then they'll start looking at the sizes of the fish. They'll count how many they're seeing, but then also the minimum size, which is the smallest fish, the maximum size, which is the largest fish, and the mean size, which is a kind of average. Then at the end, they'll do a habitat assessment, which means looking at the organisms that live on the, at the bottom of the ocean floor, things like corals and algae and gorgonians, and they'll estimate the percent of the, what they're seeing there. So I'm gonna stop here and see if you guys have any questions about anything about what we're doing and how we're doing it. 
All right, so this is Grace in the chat box. So um, if you have a question, go ahead and write it in that uh, box. I just want to really quick mention, because you used the word census, which is great, because we just had a census of people, right, where we were counting and gathering information. So just like we uh, do a census on people, they do a census on fish. So one of the questions that came on uh, came in was from Texas. What are Gargonians, which you just mentioned, I think? Yeah, Gorgonians, if you see in the video, that's what these, both this and these little long stringy things are Gorgonians. And they're a kind of organism that has stinging cells on them and um, they're, they're similar similar family to corals, but they don't have that hard skeleton. They're often called soft corals. So they're an animal. Great, and this is a great question that comes in from Laura. How do you know where the cylinders end when you're down there diving? So we use, the longer you do it, the more you are better at estimating distances. But at the beginning we have, um, we always bring down a meter stick. It's a PVC piping that's a meter long. So you can use it to measure how far your cylinder is. Great. And Sarah asks, how do you know that you're not counting the same fish twice? Sometimes that can be hard to know if you're doing that or not. But once in these, we have time limits and once you pass a certain time limit, if you see, if there's a school or something that swam through, if you see another school that it could be a new school, it could be the same one, you're not gonna count it twice just to prevent that from happening. Great, and Lucy's wondering how many people go out at a time? So on the boat, we're gonna have a varying number of people depending how big the boat is, but one survey is two divers together. They're, most importantly, you should never dive alone, so we always need to have a buddy, but the data is also averaged between the two divers. And Theodore's wondering if you've ever been out on surveys. Yes, I have been with NOAA for three years and done close to 400 surveys since then. I love it. I feel like we're getting to go on a survey with you. Wait until we get to count, just like Erin does when she's out there. Um, I just want to uh, quickly, I don't want you to answer this, but Ingrid asks, how do corals survive and how does it eat? And I'll just tell you, we've done some coral reef webinars in the past where all of that gets answered. So I encourage you to take a look at some of the past webinars that um, our speakers today have already mentioned. Um, one last question before I let you move on is, can you spell Gargonians for us? They're wondering um, exactly how that's spelled. And I'll put it in the chat box. I know I shouldn't be calling you out. <laughs> I just wrote it down real quick to see if I think I know how to spell it. It's G-O-R-G-O-N-I-A-N. Great, and I'll put that in the chat box for everyone. That's a good question. Sometimes you hear something different than what, um, it, how it's actually spelled. All right, back to you, Erin. I know you have a lot of really cool stuff to share with us. Yeah, so I wanted to give you all a chance to do a small part of what we're doing so you guys can look at the picture and tell me how many fish you see in this picture. All right, so how many fish do you see in the picture? Let's see, Kim says there are three fish in the picture. Anybody else? Let's see, Garrett says three as well. Hannah says five, Theodore says four. Mrs. Heray's class um, says three, Hadley says three, Lucy and Natalie say four. So we've got a lot of people saying three, we've got some fours and we've got some fives. How are we, are we close? Yeah, so you guys are all very close. I'm going to point out each one to you. I see four in this picture. So first we have a spot fin butterfly fish. We have a blue angel fish. We have a butter hamlet. And finally, a masked goby. Some of you might have missed the little goby. Very small fish. So we have to count even the biggest fish, but also the little tiny ones. So it can be kind of hard to find them all. Um, it takes practice. So we're gonna practice a few more times. This one has a few more fish in it. So count the number of fish you're seeing, but now there's also 
multiple of the same species. So look at what species you think, you don't have to know the species, but what different fish are you seeing also? How many? All right, this is Grace from the chat box. This one um, is a little more complicated. So how many fish do you see of each um, kind? So let's see, Isabella says that there are eight total fish. Uh, Katya sees three fish. Kim sees seven. Um, any other guesses? And you can also give us numbers by what color they are. Lucy sees eight. Nicole sees 10. So Laura says seven total, but there are three different kinds of fish. So we've got a range. Um, every A lot of people are saying there are three types or three species, but there is some um, disagreement as to how many total there are. So yeah, I, think, I think you need to show us, Erin. <laughs> I'm gonna show you, don't worry. Um, you're all, you're right. There are three different kinds of fish here. And I'll start with a French grunt, these yellow fish. And I see six French grunt. I think some of you missed that small one up in the corner. Then we have this striped species is a high hat. And finally, this species with the red fin is a red band parrotfish. So eight total fish, three different species. You guys were all really close, they're right on. Now I'm gonna do, this one's harder and you won't have time to count all of them, but you can take a guess about an estimate of how many fish you're seeing. And I'll point out the different species we're seeing afterwards. All right, so what's your guess for this one? I feel like we, we're now in uh, graduate counting. Uh, we, we went from um, the easier ones. So Theodore says 20. Hannah says 17. Uh, Garrett thinks there are 50. Texas thinks 35. Uh, Lucy thinks there are 15, three different types. Hadley, Charlie, and Michelle are in the 20s. Sarah and Nancy are in the 30s. And Julian thinks um, 25. So we're, we've got a lot of guesses between the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Yeah, you guys are great. I estimated 40 fish in this picture. So we have these gray fish right in the front here. Those are gray snappers. And then there's a fish right here that looks kind of similar to the gray snapper, but that's actually a tom tate, a kind of grunt. These blue and yellow fish are called blue striped grunts. And then finally we have these uh, yellow tailed fish. They're yellow goat fish. They're the ones with the barbs that we saw a picture of earlier. So you can see sometimes when they're swimming at you and all mixed together, it can be hard to estimate how many you're seeing in a short amount of time. But also I have another picture. Sometimes they're all the same species, but there's hundreds of them together. So big schools may swim through and we have to estimate how many you're seeing in a short amount of time. So there are a few hundred here. How many hundreds of fish do you think are in this picture? All right, this is Grace from the chat box. And before I give you their guesses, I just want to remind you all, kudos to Erin, because usually these fish are swimming as well. So not only does she have to count that many, but they're swimming by her at the same time. Um, so Texas thinks 200, Azul thinks 300, Charlie's at 250, uh, Mitsuko's at 300, Hannah thinks 900, Laura thinks 150, Garrett's around 100, Angela's hedging her bets 200 to 300, uh, Laverne is saying approximately 300. Let's see, um, a few others. Sarah thinks 400, Isabella 200, and Theodora thinks uh, 400, Jasper 300. So we're, we're in the hundreds, but we're not quite sure how many hundreds. Yeah, so I, my estimate is 300 fish, but I don't know the answer to that. That's what my guess from my experience of learning to count fish. So that's where when I mentioned that we have two divers, it's important to have two so you can compare the two estimates. I might say 300 and someone else might say 250 and we might who we don't know who's correct. So it's you average them to get a more accurate guess when you're estimating big schools like this. And finally, I wanted to end on this section with a video because like Grace just mentioned, the fish are not sitting in one place like they are in a photo. So this is what it's like when you're actually diving on a reef and you have fish swimming around you. 
you see all different species mixed in together and you got to be able to identify the species count how many they are and figure out how big they are and something like these bar jacks we see right here swimming through they're not going to stick around so you have to do it quickly enough to make sure you catch them all so sometimes we don't see certain types of different species and there are many different reasons why we might not see them um, I'm going to name a few of them here. Many of the reasons are normal and there's nothing to be concerned about, but sometimes it makes us want to think about why we're not seeing them. Here on the left, we start with a Goliath grouper. We don't see many of them because they're rare. Now, Goliath groupers used to be overfished. They are, you're no longer allowed to catch Goliath grouper, so their numbers are, have rebounded, but we still don't see a lot of them. In the middle, this is a rusty goby, and it's considered a cryptic fish. And that just means that they're there on the reef, but they're hard to find, so we might not get to count them as often as they're actually there. The goby in the picture is a really small fish and likes to live upside down in crevices. So when we're doing a survey, as you saw in the video, there's lots of fish around. Sometimes we don't have time to investigate every little crevice on the reef. And then we have species that are highly mobile, like sharks. And that just means that they may swim large distances and don't necessarily sit on one place on the reef for long periods of time. So we could be surveying a reef and five minutes before we got there, there was a shark there, but it was already gone by the time we're there and we'll never know. Or even you could have one swim behind you really quickly and you were writing something down and you missed them. So sometimes they're just hard to see because they're swim so fast by you. Then there are other times when we expect to be seeing more of a fish and we're not. This is an example of black grouper. We've mentioned groupers a few times. They are managed species, which means people like to catch and eat them. So there are rules about what you can keep and how many. And we ex would expect to see more of them because of that, but we aren't. And that might make managers that use our data want to look and see if evaluate whether the rules that are already in place are working well enough for the species and finally sometimes if we do not see we may not be seeing as much of a fish because their habitat has become disrupted this is a three-spot damselfish and they prefer to live on a type of big branching coral um, that these two species that are now highly endangered, they're Acropora corals. If you know, know anything about corals, they're also called, their common names are uh, elkhorn and staghorn. Now these populations have become very rare, so we don't see as many three-spot damselfish as we used to, and the habitat type is likely an explanation. I'm gonna stop here if anyone has any questions about any of the fish we talked about or anything else. Yeah, so this is Grace from the chat box, and um, one of the questions came in from Laura. Are your estimates of fish usually close to the number, um, you know, or are sometimes your estimates off? So I guess to add to that, do you ever take pictures to compare it to your estimates to see how close you are? We don't usually take pictures, but when you first start these surveys, you're usually not taking real data, so we'll have someone who's training to learn how to do these surveys go down with experienced divers and they will compare you, the trainee will estimate numbers like in a school like that and then they'll compare them with the more experienced divers estimates and um, learn that way to figure out if you're accurate or not we also do that when you're estimating the sizes of fish but then there's also a process at the end where we have a data manager that is looking at what your data is collected and they can compare it to historical norms and decide whether they are normal for you to be seeing that kind of amount of fish or size of fish, that kind of thing. And normally you're counting in your cylinder and the other diver is counting in their cylinder and you're not counting the same thing, is that correct? Yeah, for in general, but you have to, like we mentioned, the fish swim. You mentioned if we might see them twice, 
So often the fish are swimming through both cylinders and we'll see similar populations, which makes the uh, data comparable. And, you know, we're on one reef. So a lot of the fish will be the same, except for the small fish that sit around, but they're easier to count because they're not swimming away from you. Gotcha, thank you. And um, you may have already mentioned this, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Texas is wondering, how do you write your counts underwater? How do I rate what? How do you write your numbers down when you're underwater? Oh, write down. Yeah, so we use waterproof paper and a pencil on a clipboard. So they make paper that survives underwater and a pencil works great underwater. Excellent. All right, I think you still have a little bit. Do you still have a little bit to share with us? Uh, yes, well, I'm switching it over to Jay, but Jay has more to share. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to hold on to all the questions that I have, and I'm going to hand it back to, to Jay. All right, hi, everyone. So this question was already answered. So this is an uh, example of one of our data sheets, so underwater paper that we write on with a pencil. And then we take the data that we write underwater and we enter it into a database. And that's to make sure that we check our errors um, to go back and forth um, in the database. And then from the database, we create something called an analysis ready data set so that we can run all of our analyses. Next. Slight technical difficulties, we got this. All right, so what do we do with all the data? So uh, as much as Aaron and I love being on the reef underwater surveying fish, and if we could do that all day, we would, we do have to come back to the surface. And the reason why we are out there is because collecting these data are really important. So this graph here is looking at yellowtail snapper density. So the number of fish per area changing over time. So beginning in the early 1990s to 2016, and this black line shows them in open areas. So these are unprotected areas on the reef. And the red line shows the fish density in protected areas. And this is in the Florida Keys. And we can see that there, in the beginning, initially, there are more fish um, in these protected areas. And then the hurricane hits. And this, um, this seemed to affect the number of um, fish that we see in the protected areas. So really, the value of these data are in the time series, one year. Um, doesn't really tell you a whole lot, but when you can look at many years uh, combined with one another, you can start to see trends. So another thing that we can do with these data are look at the size of the fish. And so this is a picture of a red grouper and information, I know it's too small to read, but what this is looking at are the size of the fish in centimeters, because that's how we catch the fish. And what we would expect to see is we would expect to see more fish before they enter a size in which they can be caught by the fishery, and then we would expect to see less fish. And really, as managers, we wanna make sure that that length that they can be caught by the fishery allows them enough time to reproduce to make sure that fisheries are sustainable in the future. Another way that we can use these data are to look at status reports. These status reports were created for the public, so for you, so please take a look at them. They were also created for senators and congressmen up, in the, up on the hill, as they say, to be able to make decisions about policy that could affect coral reefs. So we did these for the Caribbean um, and Florida and flower bargaining banks couldn't fit on here, but it's done for those jurisdictions. And another group did them for the Pacific Islands as well. So this really allows you to take a look at how are fish doing, but also how are the coral, so the benthic community doing, how are socioeconomic, so people's perceptions and influences um, of the use of the resource, as well as climate. So this gives you a holistic perspective and it's um, a small pamphlet to, to share all the information that we can about the current status of these reefs. Then what do we do with all these data? In the most simplistic form, um, these data are used by our regional partners and managers. So we produce documents. Um, they're used by other marine scientists to um, do ecological studies or studies looking at how fish change over time. Um, and they're also used by the government. So there's a lot of different end users, a lot of people that use these data that we collect. 
And so starting to wrap this up here, so there are a lot of challenges that affect all fish, but if we specifically think a little bit about coral reef fish, since that's what we were talking about today, one of the major threats is habitat modification or destruction of habitats. Um, so whether that be sewer systems, you know, they're leaking out into the reef or, you know, just dropping an anchor on the reef. Invasive species such as this lionfish, lionfish naturally live in the Pacific, Indo-Pacific. Um, they're not found in the Caribbean um, until recently, so they're invasive and they are a threat because they can eat some of the smaller um, fish species or the juveniles of fish species. Uh, coral reef fish can be overfished, which um, in the US we try and do a really good job of having sustainable fisheries and have some great laws um, out there to make this happen. But you know, we can't analyze all of our stocks every single year. So, you know, we, we're trying to prevent overfishing. Bycatch is a big thing where this is when you catch a species that you didn't intend to catch. And bycatch is really hard to quantify. It's hard to know the number of bycatch and how it affects different fish species. There's pollution, so land-based sources of pollution. Um, climate change is, I think, a big one that you guys are all familiar with, um, as well as disease. So right now there's a uh, coral disease that's spreading throughout the Caribbean. And these corals are important because they are the habitat for the coral reef fish. And so we always get this question, I think it's a really important question, what can you do? I mean, what can you do? And this applies around coral reefs, it also applies wherever you live. Um, you can pick up your trash or pick up the trash of others, beach cleanup days, all of that's really important and really helps out the marine environment. Be responsible for anything that you bring, whether it's fishing gear or fishing nets. If you leave a fishing net in the water, it will continue to fish when you're not there and catch species and you're not gonna be there to let them go. So you wanna make sure that you take any gear back with you. You wanna make sure that if there are rules in place, they're in place for a reason for your benefit um, to make sure that these fish are sustainable and around for the future. So whether that be a spatial protection, so you can't fish in a certain area or it, be one of the fishing gears, size, gear type, or amount that we talked about earlier. And there's also opportunities to participate in volunteer-based citizen science initiatives um, around coral reefs. So to end on this, many of, us, many of us ask, what can I, as one person, do? But history shows us that everything good and bad starts because somebody does something or does not do something. So you all have the power to make some change. And with that, I think we can take any questions. Great, I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you for that. I'm gonna come back on and Aaron is back on. Um, so thanks so much. We have a few questions to um, ask before we're all done and I appreciate everyone's patience. I know we've gone a little long because I disappeared for a while. So apologies for the glitch at the beginning, but um, so maybe each of you could answer this. Mrs. Hiray's class is asking, what are the biggest and the smallest fish you see? So maybe one of us, one of you can tell us the biggest you've seen and one of you can tell us the smallest you've seen. I guess I'll start with, I don't know which one you wanna do, Erin, I'll start with the smallest. So one of the most common species that we see is called a mass goby. And so these fish are only a few centimeters. So uh, an inch or so. Um, long and so those are the tiniest fish that we typically see. There might be smaller ones out there, but I certainly wouldn't be able to identify them. Uh, yeah, the biggest fish I've ever seen, I think it was a hammerhead shark. So I think it was like eight feet long. So big, big shark. <laughs> nice. And how many days, this question comes in from Texas, how many days a week do you get to scuba dive for your job? It's seasonal. So we scuba dive when the weather's good. Um, so it depends on the region too. So in the Virgin Islands, we do two week, two, two week missions. Um, but in Florida, um, historically, we've sampled with small boats from June to December, although really only have good weather from about June to September. It depends. And Theodore's wondering, do you ever go back and count the same spot twice? Like maybe, you know, say two years later, do you go back to the same spot to count? 
So to give you perspective, um, there are about, we just had this in a meeting earlier today, 200,000 grid cells that we can randomly choose from in the Florida Keys, and we do 400 samples a year. So is it possible and have we? Absolutely. Is it uncommon? Yes, it's not something that we commonly do, which is sad. Sometimes the sites are spectacular. I have to say that your job sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, cha very challenging, but amazing as well. And so that leads me into the last question that I always love um, when folks ask. So Michelle asks, what's your favorite part of your job? So if, if each of you could tell us sort of the fav your favorite part of what you get to do, um, that would be great. Well, I was going to say, I'm going to let Erin go first. Go ahead. Um, the obvious answer is scuba diving. It's so much fun to go down onto a reef and there's all different kinds of reefs and we get to see different fish on the different kinds of reefs. And I've only been diving for a few years, so I see new things all the time and it's always really exciting. So my answer would be very similar to Aaron's. We got into this because we love the marine animals and we love to be close to them. And I've done thousands of dives and I still see something new every dive. But the other thing that I would say that's highly important and I've realized over time in my career is that collecting the data but not being able to share it, whether it be with the public or with managers isn't helpful. So I think one of the other really important things that I enjoy is making sure that we get the information out there. Great. Well, thank you so much. I have to say this was really fun getting to see how good we are at counting fish and, and learning the names of some of the different fish that maybe we have or haven't seen. So thanks so much for educating us on coral reef fish. I know I learned a lot. And again, if you have any coral questions, you can refer back. Um, but this was a really comprehensive. So thanks so much for that. And thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters for interpreting for us. Again, apologies for the glitch um, at the beginning. And for those of you that like to um, join us week to week, next week, we're gonna be going to the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. So we call that Webner, and it's actually here in Falmouth on Cape Cod where I'm located. So we'll be coming back to my hometown and we'll take a look at the salt marsh and um, it's gonna be really fun going out into the, the shallow bay that is Wakoit Bay. So, Thanks so much for telling us all about uh, coral reef fish. We're going from a very warm water situation to a not so warm right now water situation. Kind of fun that we get to do that in the span of a week. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great week. The recording will be up in a couple of days and have a great night. Thanks.